Good morning and welcome everyone to the next installment of Celebration of Service series. My name is Steve Schwab and I'm the CEO of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. The Dole Foundation launched our Celebration of Service series earlier this year as a way to provide a forum for leading policymakers and senior members of the administration to engage with our community. In our last episode, we were joined by Chairman Mark Takano and Ranking Member Mike Boss of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs for a rich discussion about ways they are working across the aisle to make substantive legislative changes to improve the lives of veteran families. Today, I am so pleased to welcome an incredible champion who is working at the highest levels of government on behalf of our nation's veterans and their caregivers, Ambassador Susan Rice. I'd also like to welcome our good friends, Terry Tenillion and Rory Brocious, both who have critical roles supporting military and veteran families in President Biden's administration. Before we get started, I wanna go over a few housekeeping notes. During today's event, you can submit your comments and questions in real time using the Q&A box located in the Zoom control panel. We will try to get to as many of your questions as possible during our Q&A session at the end of the hour. It is now my great honor to introduce a distinguished leader who has dedicated her life to public service, Ambassador Susan Rice. Three presidential administrations have called on Ambassador Rice to serve at the highest levels of government, and they have counted on her to oversee some of our nation's most complicated and consequential diplomatic and national security missions. Under President Clinton, Ambassador Rice served as Special Assistant to the President, Senior Director of African Affairs at the National Security Council, and U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. In 2009, President Obama named Ambassador Rice as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, where she advanced human rights and global security. In 2013, the Ambassador assumed the role of National Security Advisor. For nearly four years, the President and our nation looked to Ambassador Rice to coordinate our nation's foreign policy, intelligence, and military efforts, an extraordinary responsibility. And today, Ambassador Rice leads President Biden's Domestic Policy Council, where she drives the administration's domestic agenda, including how our nation cares for and supports those who serve and their families. For the ambassador, our national oath to care for service members, veterans, and their families is personal. Her father was a World War II veteran and an officer in the famed Tuskegee Airmen. Through his service, Ambassador Rice learned firsthand about the sacrifices made by our service members, veterans, and their families. Ambassador Rice, thank you so much and welcome. Hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Steve, for that incredibly kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I want to begin by thanking Senator Elizabeth Dole and the entire Dole Foundation for your extraordinary leadership on behalf of military and veteran caregivers and families. I also want to acknowledge and thank the great Senator Bob Dole, who's been a relentless and principled advocate and partner on disability rights and so many other vital issues. I understand you're both watching at home and I send you my very, very best. It's great to join you all. I have been fortunate in my family and my career to know and love many current and former military members and their loved ones. I grew up relishing the impassioned dinner table arguments between my father, uh, Emmett Rice, and my uncles, my mother's brothers, who first crossed paths in the segregated Army Air Force during World War II, where they were all members of the celebrated Tuskegee Airmen. My stepfather was also a veteran and held several appointments at the Pentagon. I've had the great privilege at the State Department, the United Nations, and on the National Security Council of working closely with so many outstanding military leaders from every branch. And I've seen the impact that service can take on those hidden heroes who care for them, as well as the immense pride and challenges that come with looking after someone who sacrificed so much for our country. So now as the President's Domestic Policy Advisor, I'm so honored to be responsible for driving policy related to veterans, their caregivers, families, and survivors. 
in that work, I'm so lucky to be supported by the White House's special assistant to the President for Veterans, for Veterans Affairs, Terry Tenelian, with whom I know you've worked closely and whom you'll be hearing from after this. Terry's appointment is not only a sign of President Biden's deep commitment to Veterans Affairs, having her on board with us also gives us experienced hands coordinating every day with the VA, with DOD, with Health and Human Services, the Office of the First Lady, and other agencies to prioritize the needs of veterans and their families. I'm also very glad that we're joined today by Rory Brosius, Special Assistant to the President for Military Families and Executive Director of Joining Forces, with whom we work so closely. President Biden often says that we have a truly sacred obligation as Americans to prepare and properly equip our women and men in uniform when we send them into harm's way and to care for them and their families when they return. And that is the spirit and that is the commitment we brought to our work. Caring for our service members and their families when they return means modernizing VA healthcare, the facilities, the IT systems, the workforce, the models of care. It means addressing toxic exposures by examining what administrative actions can be taken to provide health care and benefits for those who may have encountered airborne hazards, burn pits, and other harmful exposures during their military service. It means ensuring access to care in homes and communities and expanding the support for the workforce providing the care, both direct support providers and all of the family caregivers with us today. It means ensuring equity for all veterans whether that's expanding services for women or in light of this year's 10th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell by providing access to comprehensive gender affirming care. And it means mobilizing a whole of government response to eliminate veteran homelessness and reduce veteran suicide, both by supporting individuals in crisis and working to address upstream risk factors like financial problems and access to firearms. And of course, a big part of caring for those who born the battle entails caring for those like you, the spouses, parents, siblings, battle buddies. At the Domestic Policy Council, we work closely with Rory and the First Lady's Joining Forces team to ensure support for military and veteran families, for caregivers and survivors. We helped to ensure that those without health insurance could gain access to health insurance through the special enrollment period for the ACA, which reduced health care premiums and is delivering critical economic relief to families and businesses through the American Rescue Plan. We're encouraging the Federal Trade Commission to ban unnecessary occupational licensing restrictions, which needlessly burden one third of military spouses because you shouldn't have to get a new license every time you move to a new post. And that's just the start. The president's Build Back Better legislation that's now before Congress will make unprecedented investments in American families and have a powerful impact on military and veterans, families and caregivers. We're gonna take on our nation's caregiving crisis, which we've experienced well before COVID by expanding home care for older and disabled Americans and improving the conditions and pay of the home care workers who support them. We're also gonna lower child care costs for the one quarter of veterans with children at home, ensuring that middle-class families have affordable, high quality child care and never have to pay for more than 7% of their income for child care is one of the key pillars of the Build Back Better agenda. So is making universal pre-K a reality. So is providing paid family and medical leave, including to address needs related to a deployment and caring for a wounded, ill, or injured loved one. With one third of post 9-11 veterans reporting trouble paying their bills, we're going to extend the expanded child tax credit that's giving nearly 90% of American families a major tax cut and is cutting child poverty almost in half. These monthly payments to parents, which can be up to $3,600 per child per year, can help cover the cost of food, housing, healthcare, and transportation. 
That's what building back better means. And this is how we live up to our sacred obligation. I mentioned my late father earlier, and I'll close by noting that it's been now 10 years since we lost him. His health issues weren't service connected, but I still recall how vividly, I still recall vividly how difficult and scary those final years were as we cared for him. He had a stroke, two surgeries, cancer, diabetes, rehabilitation, all at the age of 90 and 91 when he passed, monitoring him closely for anything unusual, stressing every night uh, about whether he would wake up the next morning, making sure that he ate well, that he took his medicine properly, that he didn't have a fall. And for a long while, we even had trouble um, keeping a caregiver that my dad wouldn't scare off. But we were fortunate because in the toughest moments, we were blessed to have the support that we needed and all that we could hope for, but so many Americans still do not. And I want you to know that President Biden and our entire administration will not rest until you are taken care of as well as you care for your loved one. So thank you, thank you for your heroic work, for your extraordinary sacrifices and your unparalleled service to our country. We're deeply grateful. And Steve, I'll now hand it back to you. Ambassador Rice, I speak for the entire community when I say how much it means that you took the time to join us today. Those were extraordinary remarks and I really loved hearing more about your beloved father. Um, having your expertise, your passion and your determination is already making a significant difference in the lives of those we serve. It was really thrilling to hear about the administration's prioritization of caregivers. Our community is really excited about um, all of the initiatives that you outline, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with our good friends, Terry and Rory, and I'm gonna to turn to them next. I'd like to welcome now Special Assistant to the President of Veterans Affairs, Terry Tenillion, and Special Assistant to the President for Military Families and Executive Director of Joining Forces, Roy Brocious. Last year, Terry was embedded on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs as a six-month fellow. Prior to that, Terry was a senior behavioral scientist at the Rand Corporation, where she spent more than 20 years as an internationally recognized expert on military and veteran health. She has played a dynamic role in increasing the visibility and knowledge of those issues facing veterans and caregivers all across the country. Rory previously served as Deputy Director of Joining Forces during the Obama administration and as a policy advisor to First Lady Michelle Obama and Dr. Jill Biden. Rory is among our nation's most experienced, knowledgeable, and passionate military family advocates, and we are blessed to have her leading this administration's important efforts to unite the country around the needs of veterans and their families. Terry and Rory, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to dive right in because we've had a really incredible response from those who registered with um, great questions. And Terry, I'm going to turn to you first and ask. Um, you've dedicated so much of your career to expanding what we know about the needs of our nation's veteran families and our hidden heroes. What made you accept this position as special assistant to the president for veterans affairs and what changes are you hoping to lead? Well, thank you, Steve. And first I wanna start off by just really expressing my gratitude to the Elizabeth Dole Foundation for hosting us today and for having this conversation. It feels like a homecoming. Um, for me, because it really has been um, 10 years now since I had the great opportunity to sit down with Senator Elizabeth Dole and talk about the challenges that she was concerned about and help frame some of the ways in which we could understand more about the needs in this community. Um, so it's really humbling to be with all of you and think back to that very first class of Elizabeth Dole Fellows um, and just how much we learned in that time from those interactions. So first, thank you. Um, second, you know, I just want to say, um, you know, having spent the better part of the past 20 years studying the challenges that service members, veterans, their families, their caregivers and survivors um, have faced, as well as looking at the programs and policies that support them, gave me a unique view on how to really harness the whole of government approach to improve their lives. 
And when asked, I felt this was my opportunity for public service. Um, it was my chance to raise my hand and to do as others have and to kind of serve the administration and the country in a way that could help improve people's lives. And so I'm really fortunate and humbled um, to have this opportunity and know that it's a remarkable um, time in which we can really work together to make advances that will improve the lives of veterans, their caregivers, and their families. And so um, I felt that I couldn't say no. It was really something that I had to take on after all those years of talking about what needed to be done. Now it was time to try to go and, and help make it happen. And I was really quite humbled and honored when asked to serve uh, for President Biden. So thanks. Well, Terry, welcome home. Um, and we are certainly glad you said yes. Um, Rory, I am speaking for a lot of folks in our community um, and there have been several questions about this. When I say that the foundation is so happy to see that the administration brought back joining forces. For those that are new to joining forces and who might not be as familiar, can you tell us a bit more about the program? Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. I also have to echo Terry's sentiments that this is just such a great opportunity for us to be back. It does feel a little bit like old home week. Um, I'm a social worker by training and working on caregiver issues over the past 10 years, first as deputy director of joining forces and then with Dr. Biden throughout her work um, has been one of the most fulfilling things I've been able to do as a professional. So I am really thrilled to be here and to be with all of you today. Um, joining Forces in its new iteration is a White House initiative to support the families of our service members and veterans, their caregivers and survivors. Um, in our work, we uh, attempt to lift up the stories of our families and um, pursue solutions that will allow them to thrive. We have three kind of distinct areas of, of concern that we're working on. Employment and entrepreneurship is one of those. Um, health and well-being is the second and military child education is the third. Um, when folks say pillars, I actually uh, encourage them to think of things as interlocking circles. We know that the wellness and health of our families is really dependent on their ability to thrive in a variety of perspectives. And so um, we're really looking at the whole family and we're coming at it from a whole of government approach. It was very important to us in kind of building this second iteration of joining forces that we bring all of our government partners to the table and really work together to be on the same page and run towards the same goals um, from the very beginning. And it has been uh, quite an uh, exciting time for me in the East Wing to have a colleague in the West Wing like Terry, who is just, you know, amazing. And, and we're able to work really closely together and, and keep each other abreast of what's happening in our policy areas and really think about the military and veteran family space cohesively. Well, Roy, at the Dole Foundation, we call you and Terry the Wonder Twins on um, the East and West Wing. So there you go. Now you know the inside game. Um, you mentioned the whole of government approach that, that joining forces takes. Um, and we just posted in the chat the incredible report that y'all put out um, about a month ago with some extraordinary advancements across countless agencies. Can you talk a little bit about that report, Rory? And some of the implications and Terry, please weigh in as well because you both had a heavy hand I know in producing it and bringing so many of your government partners together. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we stepped into these roles in January, it was really important for us to make sure that all the players were at the table. It didn't make sense for us as joining forces to go out into the community and ask folks to fill gaps if we weren't taking a full accountability for what we were doing as government. Um, and so, you know, over a process of several months, uh, which we call an interagency policy committee, we came together with all of our interagency partners and really started plugging away on the types of proposals that we thought would impact um, the areas of interest of joining forces. Um, and so what came together was an incredible whole of government effort um, where we had over 80 unique commitments and proposals to support the military and veteran family community to include caregivers and survivors. Um, and, you know, getting every executive department's 
secretary to sign on to that was really incredible um, to see the support at the cabinet level for this community, I think is a real signal. Um, but I also want to say that a, a big part of that report was the Build Back Better agenda. And for us, anything that helps American working families helps military families too. And so it was really important for us to think about as we shaped the Build Back Better agenda, how did we make sure that military families, veteran families, caregivers, and survivors benefited from those proposals? And so um, obviously Terry has a, a, an amazingly heavy hand in, in the uh, domestic policy world on that. So she was a great partner in kind of bringing those proposals to the table. Um, but we also, I I think it's very important for me to tell you all that this is just the beginning. So this report really was just our first interagency effort through joining forces in the National Security Council to bring us around the table, but we will use that venue as an opportunity to build on goals and drive outcomes for this, this community. Terry, I saw some of what I've heard you talk about over the last many years represented in that report. So when Rory says you had a heavy hand, I know you did. Anything that you'd add to Rory's comments about your thoughts on the product, the great product that y'all put out? I also probably shouldn't have said heavy hand. I should have said 30,000 pound brain. Heavy hand to me <laughs> insinuates something else. That's not what I meant. Terry's 30,000 pound brain brought a lot of great content to the table. That's right. Well, thank you, Rory. I mean, it was really quite a pleasure to support the work that Joining Forces did in uh, concert with the National Security Council and ensure that our domestic agencies were at that table and taking the opportunity seriously and using it as a, a way to engage and think about how their programs, which may not be completely labeled for military service members and their families or for veterans or for veteran caregivers, could actually support and help this community. And so it's something I've said for a long time, you know, veterans are people too. And so as we think about the policies that we're advancing to try to help secure, um, you know, additional economic relief or other types of programs, um, childcare, paid leave, you know, all these policies are critically important for supporting this community. And so making sure that my colleagues who were experts in those fields were part of the dialogue and asking, you know, how are we ensuring that we're looking at the unique circumstances or the special needs of the military and veteran community in our policy making. And so it was really great to be able to complement and add um, to what that NSC and Joining Forces team were leading with that report. And it is just the beginning. Um, you know, we will always say, stay tuned. Uh, we are continuing to work really hard um, and leaning in in other ways that we can provide support. Thanks so much, Terry. You know, Terry and Rory, as you both know, the last couple of months have been extremely challenging for our nation, uh, for the veteran community. Um, and we've seen, um, we've also seen a, a spike, a surge around mental and emotional health support. What kind of a message do you all have for the community on the withdrawal from Afghanistan? Um, and what do you say to those veterans who, and sadly, as we approach Veterans Day, we've seen too many veterans um, question their service. And, and, and I know you both know, as I do, that um, those are the things we don't want to see because the, the, their mission uh, did so much to protect us and, and those we love over the 20 years that we were in Afghanistan. So just some thoughts from either or both of you um, on, on that would be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to take it first and then hand it to Terry. Um, Steve knows this. A lot of people on the phone know this. I'm from a military family. The summer was particularly challenging for our community. Um, I think my message to um, all of our families and all of our service members and veterans is that your service mattered. And if you need help or you need support, please reach out. For those of you who are in a place to provide that support, please do that. Um, I think one of the things I have seen in the past several months is obviously a lot of peer support, people coming together and really supporting one another during a time 
that is very challenging. We're a very small community. We're a very strong community, but I think we often turn to ourselves instead of um, looking outward for, for resources as well. And so I think I would just encourage folks who need support right now to give yourself some grace, to ask for help when you need it, um, to understand that there is an entire community uh, of support for you. Um, and that, you know, as, as Dr. Biden says, this is a community bound together by love. Um, in, in the Marine Corps family, we used to say born into, sworn into, married into, and that matters. Those bonds matter. And so reach out to your people, hold your people tight. And, and again, give yourself the grace to ask for help if you need it. I think Rory said it so well. My message would be consistent with what you've heard from other leaders in the administration. You know, these have been difficult times. And, you know, to those who served in Afghanistan, as well as those who served in Iraq and the other surrounding areas, um, we know you kept our nation safe. You put your lives at risk for our safety and our freedom. So I will always say your service mattered. And I'm grateful to you and to your families. Um, and I will be continuing to work tirelessly to advance policies that will support you and your loved ones. And um, as many of you know, I'm also working really hard to um, advance the priorities the president has for expanding access to mental health um, and behavioral health services for all Americans, but especially those who are dealing with the stress um, you know, of the, the last few months within our community. Um, and for those of you that are continuing to serve by helping to support each other and to support the resettlement of our Afghan allies, I say thank you. And I will just always be grateful for the strength, the courage, and as Rory mentioned, the love that this community shows for each other um, and you know, for the nation. So. Thank you both so much. Uh, and to our community, as, as Rory said, and as Senator Dole has said over and over over the last couple of weeks and months, your service does matter. Your service continues to matter. The service that our caregivers provide in homes all across the country matters. Um, and Rory, I love that you mentioned grace, which is something we talk a lot about at the foundation. Um, and I wanna repeat what, and amplify what Rory said, it's important to give yourself grace. We, we need to do that in our, in our daily lives, no matter where we are, where we come from, but especially for our veterans and their families during the, the tough circumstances of the last couple of months. Um, we value you, we love you. And if you need help, um, hiddenheroes.org and uh, please check out our, our chat room. Um, we're there for you 24 hours a day. Terry, um, I'm gonna put you a little bit on the spot um, because we know where you came from, but we know where you are now. You had a little bit to do with a little study that we did at the Dole Foundation that we unveiled in 2014 with Rory uh, and the then First Lady Michelle Obama at the White House. It was a RAND study and I know you don't have your RAND hat on right now, but um, you were the lead author on that study and uh, the results and the success and the impact that that study had, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think it's unparalleled. And um, and that's why we're so proud to see you where you are now, because we know you live those values out in your work every single day. Um, last week we announced we're going to do a Rand 2.0, and while you're not at Rand, uh, you're somewhere else that might be able to help with what with what Rand tells us in that second study. Can you? Tell us a little bit what, from an administration perspective, what you might hope to gain. I know a research is something you very much want to leverage in your work. Um, what, what do you hope to learn from another study on the caregiving front? Sure, and I think more broadly, I mean, I bring to this role my background as a researcher, as a data geek, as I often self-profess, as someone who's really eager to understand the evidence and the information that we have to really make sure that we're understanding the problem correctly, that we're looking at all of the dimensions and all of the components of what is a very complex um, dynamic uh, experience caregiving. And so, you know, like other policy challenges, I am going to be looking to ensure that the, uh, you know, we're documenting and understanding the nature of the needs and understanding the issues and the problem, that the right questions have been asked, 
Um, and then really in, in kind of trying to think about how are we evaluating potential solutions? Are we looking at the potential benefits as well as the potential consequences of different options and solutions? Things may sound like quick wins, but when we're really trying to achieve sustainable, meaningful change that will impact people, not just today, but for tomorrow and into the future, you know, we kind of need to really unpack and understand exactly what those policy solutions will entail. And how do we, you know, accomplish that? Um, this is an administration that's very committed to science and to evidence and using that evidence to drive um, some of the decisions that we will make. So I'm committed to looking uh, at uh, the challenges and the issues that I'm gonna tackle in that same manner. And so I'm eager for, you know, study 2.0. Um, pleased that, you know, the, the team is back together to try to tackle, um, you know, what has been an a rapidly evolving 10 years um, in the landscape of military and veteran caregivers. So I know that, you know, I read, you know, again, those of you who know me, know that I like flip to the methods section, I read the data points, you know, I ask a lot of tough questions. So that's what you can expect. Um, but I'm really eager to look forward to kind of what it reveals in terms of potential policy solutions on the horizon. Roy, thanks. And for, or sorry, Terry, thanks. Um, and for our community who might be unaware, and maybe that was a surprise to some of you, we have indeed announced the commissioning of a second major study, multi-year study. We want to thank our friends at Wounded Warrior Project and the Lilly Endowment for their support, enabling us to perform the next phase of works that's going to inform the Dole Foundation, we hope Congress, the administration, and the hundreds of organizations that we work with across the country to support military veteran caregivers, their families, hidden helpers, the children inside military and veteran families um, for the next decade. Um, Rory, I wanna to turn to you and ask you a question about the First Lady. She's a military mom, she's an educator. Um, I know y'all were just overseas. I think for you, it was a quick trip to Italy and back, spent some time at a military base um, can you talk about how the First Lady's background um, and certainly your own inform the work and the priorities that you're undertaking at Joining Forces? Sure, Steve. So as, as you mentioned, Dr. Biden is an educator. She's a military mom. Um, I'm a social worker and a military family member. Um, you know, I think one of the ways that Dr. Biden really thinks about this work is prioritizing and lifting up um, the gathering of insights from the community. We want to make sure that the issues that we are tackling are things that the community is actually telling us they need. Um, she always says that we treat the military family experience as our North Star, and that is how we should really be looking um, at this work. And I could not agree with her more on that. And I have to say, um, yes, I was in Italy for 22 hours, but we got some really great time with some command teams and students and teachers at a Dodia school in Naples that helped us really understand the experience of these kiddos in Oconus schools. Um, obviously, both Dr. B and I have been doing this work for a long time, but the, the world has changed since we first launched Joining Forces in 2011. And so for us, it's really important that we are staying on the ground, that we are talking to folks. We were at Joint Base Charleston last week, um, you know, chatting with some of the families who had just welcomed service members home from the airlift. Those are things that we need to be responsive to and we need to hear what they're experiencing so that we can bring that information and data back as we work with our National Security Council and our Domestic Policy Council on what we're hearing. Um, the First Lady obviously has a very unique platform. We do not have a you know congressional mandate. We really don't have a budget. So we are here to use a bully pulpit that is really incredible. Um, and Dr. Biden is incredibly passionate about these issues. And we have a team here in the East Wing that is incredibly passionate about these issues. Um, and so I'm excited about the opportunity to keep working on them um, and to keep hearing from families and caregivers and survivors as we go forward. Thanks so much, Rory, for that perspective. While we're on the subject, um, can I ask the two of you to outline some of the near term, you know, we're approaching the end of the, uh, unbelievably, the end of your first year administration, the world 
is beginning to open up again, which we're so thankful for. I was at an event last night in, in DC, my first in-person dinner. It was a little discombobulating seeing people and being around people again, but progress has been important on that front. Um, and as the country begins to open up, um, when you think about what's important for this community, what are the, what are the near-term priorities? Terry, maybe we start with you. Yeah, no, happy to start. And thank you for that question, Steve. You know, it is it is amazing to kind of think about how time has flown by and the challenges that we have had to confront and, you know, really trying to address and um, get the COVID-19 pandemic under control remains a top priority. And yesterday's, you know, announcement to be able to vaccinate children five to 11 years old, I think is a, is a really wonderful turning point. And so, I am hopeful that we see the light at the end um, or on the horizon and that, you know, more people will be able to have experiences like we did and being able to gather and, um, at dinners. And certainly this is the season for our community of gathering for galas and webinars. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that um, our continued efforts to lead the nation through the COVID-19 pandemic will be successful. But we're also focused right now on building back a better future for all Americans, um, you know, and the Build Back Better legislation that's before Congress right now. These are much needed improvements um, for our infrastructure, for expanding programs and supports for families to thrive. And that will help military service members, their families, veterans, their families, especially caregivers. The provisions that are outlined in this legislation that will support family caregivers are going to be incredibly important um, for you know, recognizing the service and sacrifice that we know our family caregivers have faced. Um, but we are also very focused on driving other priorities for the veteran and the caregiver community. Within the veteran portfolio, I'm focused really on modernizing the VA healthcare system. As you heard Ambassador Rice say, we want to ensure access to world-class state-of-the-art healthcare for veterans um, who are enrolled in VA. And we know that this is important to their caregivers as well. We need to improve the systems to ensure that we can guarantee timely access to high quality services and benefits. You've heard the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs talk about this all the time. Um, he's really focused on ensuring access and outcomes. And those are really important because that matters. That's what matters to veterans and their loved ones. We're also deeply committed to ending veteran homelessness through a whole of government approach, reducing military and veteran suicide, um, being aggressive and addressing the adverse health effects that may result from military related exposures and ensuring that we're meeting the unique needs of women veterans across programs and really kind of a, a, a critical focus on equity for all of our veterans and their families. And so that's a, that's a, a big list um, and it, it, it is what's keeping us committed and driving us. And I'm very fortunate to be situated within the Domestic Policy Council with some tremendous colleagues who are experts on housing and homelessness or who are experts in workforce um, so that we can use those talents to address the needs for this population as well. So that's my to-do list. <laughs> Just a small list, Terry. Rory, anything you'd add? Sure. I think, um, you know, Terry outlined the administration goals really beautifully. Um, I think it has really been all hands on deck for us. We have all been supporting the efforts to build back better and through, you know, the American Rescue Plan and other policy agenda items, we have really all been trying to focus on, on just making sure that we are in a place where this country is, is able to thrive. Um, and so for me and joining forces, I think this year has really been for me about bringing our cross-agency partners to the table. And I think um, as we talk about what we wanted to achieve in the first year, I think one of the, the greatest things that we were able to do through the Joining Forces IPC report was really bring all of the executive agencies on board as partners for the Military Spouse Employment Partnership. Um, I think it's really an important signal that we are not going to the private sector and asking them to do something that we as government are not willing to do ourselves. And so, you know, ensuring that the federal government is, is an employer of choice for our military family members, 
caregivers and survivors is an incredibly important goal of mine. Um, you know, I think we also have been really focused on ensuring that our data collection is helping us actually understand what is happening in the community. Um, and Terry has been such a wonderful ally on this with us. There are obviously hundreds of data collections that happen across the government every year, but making sure that we actually have a picture that allows us to, you know, compare apples to apples and look at how the military community is fair in one, one area versus how the civilian community is faring is really important to us. And so I think, you know, as we move forward, you can expect to see from us a lot of transparency through that IPC uh, process. We're working through a lot of sub IPCs right now on specific topics like food insecurity and children in caregiving homes that I will allow us to really report out on the ways that the agencies can address these. Um, I'm obviously also very excited to be working with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and Wounded Warrior Project on the Hidden Helpers Project. Um, we are very excited about some of the commitments that are going to be brought to bear to make sure that kiddos in caregiving homes who may not have even been alive when their parent um, suffered their injuries or wounds um, are, are supported in the way that they should be. And I will say one final thing about the Hidden Helpers work, which is I really am excited about the opportunity to learn and gather insights from our hidden helpers community that might also help us learn how children in other caregiving homes can be supported. And I think that that's a really important part of our joining forces work is if we're finding solutions that work for our populations, are those also scalable solutions for other populations in need as well? And so that's um, kind of a, an approach that I like to take because we know that the military community can lead in innovation and that's an exciting thing to think about. Roy, we couldn't agree more and we're proud to be partnering with you and joining forces as well. Um, you know, something Senator Dole has said since the very first day that I met her, you, you know, you all have talked about your whole of government approach to serving veterans and their families. And we often talk at the Dole Foundation about the whole of family approach that it takes for veteran wellness, health, recovery, and rehabilitation. And so the children inside the homes of the folks we serve um, is a big uh, new frontier for us to understand, to know and support more moving into the long road ahead as veterans continue to recover from the longest period of war in his history. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll release some really important research that helps the country understand the implications on the family model and on the children who are in these homes. You know, <clears throat> Terry and Rory, <clears throat> I noticed a comment in the chat room from, um, and I hope he doesn't mind me quoting him, but he put it in there publicly, Hugh Schertz. Um, and Hugh talks about the plight of pre-9-11 caregivers and talks about how most caregivers of pre-9-11 veterans can't leave their home due to the constant care that's required. Um, and we, you know, and that a lot of folks don't realize that Hugh, that's what we at the Dole Foundation try to do every single day is to inform Americans and to mobilize communities for folks like you. And I know my team has <clears throat> offered you a couple ideas on some programs that we might offer to support you. But Terry, <clears throat> there's a lot of um, comments and questions that have come in around the expansion of the program for comprehensive assistance at the VA. Um, the fact that for the first time, pre-9-11 caregivers are going to be eligible for support. I know the administration, and this certainly isn't your direct area responsibility, but you did talk a lot about your work with the VA on your to-do list. I know this administration is working hard to implement that program. Can you shed a little light for, for Hugh and, and for other caregivers in the pre-9-11 cohort who are so looking forward to that additional support and what might be on the horizon? give a little glimpse. I mean, I think the most important thing that the community should take away is the importance of this topic and the commitment that the secretary has to being able to support caregivers of all eras um, by appointing a senior advisor um, for families and caregivers and make habit. And there's no one better um, to really be helping uh, to drive that program forward. And certainly her role early on in establishing the program of comprehensive support for family caregivers and, and kind of the you know, real world experience that she has in supporting caregivers is great. So she's a wonderful partner for us. Um, obviously, both Rory and I have known Meg for years. And so it's a tremendous opportunity that we have to ensure that we're advancing the president's priorities 
the first lady's priorities in this area, as well as the secretary's priorities. And so, you know, this is something that Meg and the team are working um, very carefully on. And, you know, we are supporting and partnering with them to the extent that, um, you know, we are able and looking forward to seeing how, um, you know, the experience, as, as Rory said, you know, the grounding factor for us is being able to hear from the community about their lived experience and getting a better sense of where things are working well and where things um, may need improvement. So as that program continues to um, expand um, over the next year and uh, the work continues as it's really rapidly expanded in size, I'm eager to kind of see how it is going to benefit um, many, many more caregivers uh, across the US. But I would also kind of continue to emphasize that there are a number of other programs that we're strengthening um, through the Build Back Better legislation um, for individuals who are providing care and assistance in the home to um, older individuals as well as others with disabilities that um, all of our veteran and military caregivers will benefit from as well. Terry, thanks so much for that perspective. And Hugh, thanks for your comments and for those of many, many other caregivers, both pre and post 9-11, who've written in some really important questions um, that we'll, we'll get to in a minute. And as we transition into more of those open questions, I wanna thank some of our key partners who I know are tuning in, Wounded Warrior Project, USAA, Cerner, Comcast, the Bob and Dolores Hope Foundation, Phillips and Prudential. Thanks for your incredible support to our community Terry and Rory, um, seeing a lot in the chat and in questions around the continued um, epidemic of suicide. Um, and we, um, you know, speaking for our community, we, we know there have been efforts across government dating back years um, around veteran suicide because there has to be. But we also know there's a more a sort of global national issue around suicide, right, Terry? Suicide's a national epidemic. Um, we've seen these, um, these increases in ideation even across the caregiver community as folks like Hugh and Sue and others who are commenting confront the kinds of issues they do day to day. We were pleased to see the administration, I think it was just this week or late last, um, introduce a new, I think, five-point plan around suicide prevention. Could you all give us um, some more details on, on where we're headed on that? And and how we, we all might be able to get involved? Sure, absolutely. And, and thanks for that question, Steve, because it is brand new and we're really excited that we have now unveiled um, this new strategy, which brings clarity and focus um, to some of the evidence-based solutions that we really wanna drive forward from the federal government in partnership with states, local governments, tribal organizations, as well as nonprofit and community-based organizations, because we recognize that everyone has a role in reducing suicide risk and preventing suicide death. And so um, earlier this week, we did unveil um, what is the product of what Rory referred to earlier as an interagency policy committee, where we brought representatives um, and subject matter experts together from across the different agencies. So in this strategy, which is about military and veteran communities, um, we still had people from the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, all come together to try to focus in on what are the ways in which we can really turn up the volume and get um, ahead of this suicide um, crisis that we have in the military and veteran population. So we did identify five priority goals. The first um, really is the big um, piece because we know far too many of our service members and veterans die by suicide each year and overwhelming majority of them as the result of a firearm. Um, so our number one priority goal is to improve lethal means safety. This is really focused on encouraging safe storage behaviors so that we can help put time and space between someone in crisis and the needs of self-harm, including medications as well as firearms. And this is going to include a massive public education campaign that will include materials, not just for the um, members of the military and veteran community, but for caregivers, for providers, to be able to have those conversations about secure, safe storage of um, uh, those lethal means. 
The second is really about enhancing crisis care. We need to make sure that all providers are trained in the delivery of evidence-based crisis care, no matter where they work, call centers, mobile crisis units, and emergency departments, because we know that this community could actually be interacting with any of those settings. And so we want to know that that best quality care for crisis services is delivered. We also want to break down uh, the barriers that we know exist to effective care. So we're gonna increase access by looking at the barriers that we need to uh, remove and minimize associated with people getting help um, and looking at how we can continue to train providers in the evidence-based approaches that we know will help reduce suicide risk. Um, this in my other hat with mental health and substance use, it also means ensuring parity and that there's access to affordable coverage that includes mental health benefits and substance use care for those um, who need it, because by delivering that care, we reduce suicide risk. Then we also are going to get at those upstream risk and protective factors. And you're going to focus on supporting programs in the community that improve economic opportunity, build skills, promote connectedness um, for the entire service member, veteran, and family community. And that's really where our partnerships with all of you are going to be really critical. And then finally, you know, coming back to the need for data, for research, for integration of those data and evaluation. So we're really ensuring that we're linking across federal data systems and kind of upgrading our, our ability to have real-time data surveillance so that we can learn lessons, innovate, evaluate new programs and then translate those findings into practice as quickly as we can because we are really focused on saving lives. And while we were pleased to see the numbers that were released by the VA this past September, that there was a, a decrease, a 7% decrease in the number of veterans who died by suicide in 2019 as compared to 2018, we want to keep going and drive that number down further because even one suicide is one too many. Um, so this is someplace that we're really um, very focused and committed. Um, and our first strategy is focused on military and veteran um, populations, but we know that other populations are at high risk too. Um, and we're going to be working and focusing on how we can tailor approaches to meet the needs of those uh, communities also. Terry, thank you so much. Um, you know, this, uh, is a mission that Dole Foundation um, is committed to. We look forward to partnering with you and your administration colleagues. Um, we think this new approach is really innovative um, and we're gonna need this community um, to understand and respond. So we look forward to helping you amplify these goals and, and, and execute um, as much as we can. Lots of questions coming in, about a dozen plus questions as Congress is debating the president's agenda around benefits for caregivers, paid family leave, um, is it in, is it out? What does it mean? Um, can can y'all clarify a little bit more around those kinds of benefit questions and where those, where those kinds of programs stand right now? Um, I know things are moving pretty fast, so one never knows, um, but we have had at least a dozen questions on that topic specifically. Things are moving pretty fast and I'm paying attention to this. So I will be honest that I'm not watching the screen on my wall in terms of what's happening right now with various different press conferences. Um, but know that we are you know, committed to trying to make historic investments in ways that we can support family caregivers. And so we're eager to see what we can get across the finish line. But as you keep hearing from us, that's not the end. Um, you know, We're continuing to kind of work on other opportunities where we can take um, bold action and continue to do more to support um, unpaid family caregivers in particular. That's great, Terry. Just to foot stomp Terry, I just want to remind it, when she says this is just the beginning, this is the first quarter. We are not going to stop working on these issues. We are not going to stop pushing this. We know that they are critical for American working families to include our caregiving families, um, and we will keep um, you know, beating that drum uh, as we can as an administration. Thanks for that response, Rory. Rory, a, a couple questions around the diversity of groups that are involved in joining forces. And I know it's a big net that y'all have cast across the country to engage, but some really important questions around <clears throat> from some folks who are facing disability issues, blind and visually impaired veterans and their families, a couple of questions around those kinds of issues. and. <clears throat> Folks wonder if 
if you're engaging with organizations um, and joining forces that represent the disabled community, folks who are blind and visually impaired and have those physical disabilities. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for those of you who are not familiar with the structure of the White House, we absolutely have an office in public engagement that helps us to connect with relevant stakeholder groups. Um, and so uh, part of that work is really making sure that we're working with organizations like Blinded Veterans of America and others to make sure that we are reflecting the experiences of those families in the work that we do. Um, I also saw some interesting questions about technology for those um, who are living with a disability. And I think that is actually an area in which joining forces is, is pretty uniquely situated is that we have great relationships with our, you know, private sector and nonprofit partners and have some ability to kind of, we have convening authority, essentially. That's that's really our big authority here in the East Wing is convening authority. Uh, but I think that there are some great things we can learn from our stakeholder groups. And we're always committed to kind of keeping that tent open, opening the aperture and making sure that we're getting um, a clear picture of what the diversity of our population looks like. Great, Roy, thanks. Terry, anything else you'd want to add on that one question? Just to punch a little bit, you mentioned some of your work around modernizing the VA system. Could part of that be around access issues um, that that kind of a community might face? It absolutely is. In fact, if you saw when we um, proposed the original American Jobs Plan um, and we're requesting funding and you know we're um, eager to kind of see the funding um, for VA and VA healthcare facilities in the Build Back Better legislation. It is really focused on um, upgrading the facilities, not only to ensure that we can meet the needs of women veterans, but that we can meet the needs of older and disabled veterans so that these facilities are accessible. Um, and so that is a primary focus of some of those investments um, in ways that we can kind of address the needs of those particular populations but then also as we think about the way in which, you know, the average age of VA healthcare facilities is 58 years old. And so medicine has really changed quite a bit. Um, and so ensuring that we can deliver, you know, kind of the highest quality um, state-of-the-art care in these facilities is a primary focus. Thanks, Terry. That's wonderful news. I know Senator will be, Senator Dole will be very pleased to hear that as she chairs the the Secretary's Committee on Caregivers, Families, and Survivors. And speaking of survivors, um, some really wonderful points made in chat and questions being asked around benefits for parents who, or other loved ones, who eventually, sadly and tragically, lose their care recipient and themselves become survivors. And I'll offer to the community that um, TAPS, um, EDF, and the Red Cross right now have started a, a really important partnership around exploring all the available research and resources that are out there right now. Um, and to truly understand the caregiver to survivor continuum, we're working really, really closely with the VA and DOD. Um, got a lot of smart minds uh, forecasting the needs of folks as they transition from being a caregiver to a survivor. And I can tell anybody who's, who's in that um, situation now that more will be coming and that there's a commitment from this administration. I don't want to speak for, for Terry and Rory, but Meg and, and the team at VA are very engaged in the work that we're doing around this transition. And Senator Dole has made it a priority of, um, of the task force of the, of the Federal Advisory Committee that, that Secretary McDonough has empowered her to chair. Just in the last minute or two, Terry and Rory, We've had a chance to have really wonderful dialogue with, um, with both of you and, and have Ambassador Rice with us at the top to frame this conversation. Um, great diverse representation and energy and passion from our community and the questions in the chat. What are a couple of things that each of you would wanna say before we conclude that we might've missed um, or any messages you wanna to send to the community? We really appreciate any uh, final thoughts from the two of you. And, and as folks are, um, are, are wondering why we didn't get to their question or their comment, for those of you that asked you know, specific questions around your own situations, we'll be following up with you um, individually to make sure that we get you answers on the kinds of questions you put forward. But, but, but Terry and Rory, uh, final thoughts. Sure. Um, 
I will just say on behalf of the First Lady, thank you to all of the caregivers who are on this call today, to all of the veterans who are on this call, and to all of those of you who are committed to supporting them. Um, this work is critical and part of our, as the president says, sacred obligation. Um, we could not be the nation we are without your service. And we are just incredibly grateful for you. And as I said earlier, I know it has been a very challenging time for a lot of us in the past several months. Um, and I would just encourage you to reach out if you need help. Um, and again, give yourself the grace you need um, because we know that you're strong and resilient and amazing, but we also want you to have what you need to be okay. Um, and you have my word that I will never stop working on behalf of this community um, for as long as I have this chair. Roy, thank you so much. Terry? Yeah, I, I just want to echo, you know, my um, thanks. As Rory mentioned, we're really grateful for the opportunity to be here and kind of share what we're doing with this community. And like Rory said, and this is something that I feel like I've said repeatedly to this community, um, take care of yourselves and take the time um, to get some respite. And as Rory phrased it, you know, have the grace, um, you know, to be able to take a pause and get the help that you may need and know that there are many of us who recognize the service and sacrifice. I grew up in a caregiving household, so I know the challenges and the complexities um, and the dynamic nature of what you're facing. And so, um, you know, look forward to continuing to learn um, from all of you and, and how we can remain committed to addressing um, and driving policies that will make your lives better. So thank you. Thank you again to Ambassador Rice, Terry, and Rory, uh, and to all of you for joining us today for this important discussion and for all the excellent questions and comments you submitted. For all the caregivers who are with us today, we encourage you to sign up for our Hidden Heroes Caregiver Community if you've not already done so. If you care for a wounded, ill, or injured service member or veteran, become a part of our community by visiting hiddenheroes.org slash join. And also, I wanna make sure that caregivers are aware of free, help available right now. Through the Respite Relief Program, you and your family can receive free caregiving support and an extra set of hands to help at home, giving you time to take care of you, as Terry just said so importantly. Let us knock things off your to-do list. Take advantage of this free resource exclusively for military and veteran families. We're doing this in partnership with the VA, thanks to our friends at CareLinks and Wounded Warrior Project, and we invite you to learn more and apply at hiddenheroes.org slash respite. This has been another wonderful celebration of service episode. My good friends, Terry and Rory, thank you for your passionate and dedicated leadership. Um, we continue, uh, we'll look forward to continuing to work with you over the weeks and months ahead. And we'll bring you back um, in the administration's second year. I'll be here before we know it. Um, but thanks for all you're doing and thanks for the community for joining us today. Have a great day, everybody.